and Brian and recording this. And <laughs> you can also, I'll be welcoming questions throughout the private presentation. So like, if you want me to stay on the slide longer or you want to look at something, just let me know and I'd be happy to wait a little bit or answer a question. Yeah. Um, let me just get to that question. All right. So, if you click it, works. I'm going to try going to the next slide. And if not, I use my mouse. Okay, that works. <laughs> all right. Um, I just wanted to have a little outline for you all so you know my train of thought throughout this presentation. So first I'll start be starting with an introduction, um, talking about what California native plants are and what they look like and all that stuff. And then I'll be going into the importance of them and why it is important to care for them and preserve them. And then I'll bring in, um, because I'm honored to speak to a Christian um, group and I myself being a Christian, I would like to bring in a Christian perspective of stewardship for native plants. And then I'll also be going over some human benefits you can also get from native plants. Yeah, thank you all. So as an introduction, so I mentioned California native plants, but I should back it up a little bit and first talk about what native plants are in general. Um, so I pulled together some um, definitions that we could go over that hopefully will help clear things up a bit. So in general, native plants are plants that occur naturally in their region without human introduction. And usually they would have been in an area for at least thousands of years. Um, and because of that, they were they have evolved to be adapted to that specific environment. And that means that they have this relationship with the land that they grow on, the soil that they grow on, they're adapted to that soil. And they also have co-evolved with the other creatures that live around it. So that includes the insects in the area, the birds and the other creatures. So they co-evolved with them to have a special relationship and they're intertwined with them to create like this ecosystem in which they all live and thrive in together. So yeah, those are native plants in general. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Perfect. And now we'll go into California native plants. So in California, we have over 6,000 native plant species. And I recently checked a website, the California Native Plant Society's website, and they said that there's over 6,500. So that number just keeps increasing. <laughs> and another amazing thing is how about 2,000 of those are endemic to the state. And that means they only occur in California. So they're very special and they're usually rare um, as they're only found in California. And they're super diverse. I have a picture up there um, that I went with a friend to her study area where she does research. And this is just one photo from her site. And you can already see there's a variety of color already happening there. So I'll be going over how diverse they are. Um, so first off, in California, um, not only do you have a lot of different plants, they occur in different habitats. And there are a lot of different habitats, but I just highlighted these four just to give you an idea. Um, for example, we have coastal environments, and those are plants that are adapted to more like salty soils because of the sea and ocean, they get that sea spray over them. So they tend to be um, halophytes, so plants that like sandy soil. Um, so that picture is taken down at San Diego, actually at Point Loma. So I got a nice photo of those um, sunflowers. Um, we also have woodland. So this is up in Big Bear area. So we have a lot of pine trees um, growing there as well. And also we have salt marshes. This photo was taken at an estuary, which is where the saltwater ocean meets the freshwater river. And they have a unique diversity of plants and animals that coexist there, which is really cool. And also we have deserts, which I think most of us are familiar with, but yes, we do have deserts. <laughs> and other habitats I didn't mention, but if you'd like to learn more, we also have grasslands and we also have chaparral shrubs. So they're all also all in California. And not only do they grow in different habitats, they also have a variety of growth forms. And these are like some examples of what growth forms are. And that basically just means like whether they're a shrub or a tree and whatnot. So first I want to go over how, so we have a lot of native, native plants that make good ground covers. So they have, they go low to the ground. They actually make great, um, like good covers if you wanted to have them. And we actually have a native species of strawberries. So that's what I have in the photo up there is a native strawberry plant. And they make the cutest little strawberries. I actually tried some a few days ago. They're very itty bitty, but they still taste good. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
so if you ever want some native strawberries, we have those too. Um, we also have herbs such as salvia, which are sages, and that is also very important to the indigenous groups in the area. And we also have shrubs that include dry bees, which are gooseberries and currants. So we have like um, golden currants, that's probably my favorite one so far. Oh, yes, Sam, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, backing up, you don't have to back up to the last slide, but in terms of, um, you know, our uh, eco zone or, or biome, um, I don't you thought we were um, chaparral, but somebody recently said, no, we're not chaparral, we're something else. So what what are we exactly right here in, let's say, in the, the Claremont, um, the area of the Botanic Garden? Right, that is a great question. Um, I would lean us towards like a chaparral scrub, so it's not entirely desert desert. I think I don't know how to specifically define chaparral scrub. I think it's like intermediate, like it's a little bit more moisture than a desert, but still pretty dry compared to like a marsh or the coast. Um, so I, I think I would agree with that, but I would need to confirm. So don't quote me on that answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, we also have shrubs, so that's gooseberries, um, and then we also have vines. I didn't know we had native vines, but the picture I have up there is um, the genus Calisegia, which is actually morning glory. It's mm -hmm. really lovely, and yeah, they are, they are native to California. And we also have trees, and like when you think of trees, of course we have our sequoias, but I didn't have a picture of a sequoia, but I did have a picture of manzanita, so there's a photo of that for you. Um, and something I wanted to point out is even though I kind of assigned these different plants to these growth forms, they're not confined to them. So for example, the salvia, it's an earth, but also it can grow to be pretty big, like almost like a shrub sort of shape. And then same with the manzanita, I put it under tree, but there are also different species of manzanita that are smaller and more like a little shrub. So there's a lot of variety within the growth forms and the plant groups. Yeah, we've seen our sages out here grow yeah. big. Oh yeah, <laughs> we we can let them get big. Yes, they they can get pretty big. <laughs> I actually have a good picture about about a salvia a sage later on in the presentation. Um, so also in addition to the different growth forms and different habitats, we also have plants with different life cycles. And usually with flowering plants, we tend to categorize them in annuals versus perennials. And annuals are plants that start in one season, let's say they start from seed in the spring of one year and they grow up, they get a flower and they produce seed and then they pass away by the next spring. So then the next year it is the new seed that will start mm -hmm. growing. Mm -hmm. So examples of that would be tidy tips, which are a popular sunflower. Um, we also have the California bluebell, which is lovely, as well as the five spot, which I believe grows in like more desert habitats, so it's really cute. Mm -hmm. And then we also have perennials, and they're basically plants that persist for more than um, a year. So they live on for two plus years. And those tend to be more like shrubs, so like the apricot mallow and blue flax, which have lovely flowers, and also trees are perennials. So the holly leaf cherry, which also has been used by the indigenous groups in this area. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that about annuals and perennials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That. <laughs> it makes me, I've always heard the words annuals and perennials, but I just never understood like, well, what does that mean? So I figured at least someone else would understand my struggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so besides that, I also want to like, put together other characteristics of California native plants that I did not know of until like more recently. So I usually, when you think of California, I picture like more desert plants that tend to thrive in the sun and be good with the dryness. But we also have some variety in that. We also have a lot of plants in California that prefer the shade. And that would include the vine I mentioned, the morning glory vine. That's a very good shade plant. And also coral bells, which I have in that photo right there. They make beautiful mm -hmm. flowers in different shades from like light pink to dark red. And they're very nice to have if you have a shady area in your yard. Um, and what was their name again? Uh, which one? The what one shade? in the picture. Oh, that's a coral bell. Um, also, it's in the genus Poitra. I could put it in the chat. No, that's okay. Coral bell. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Coral bell. 
Yeah, sure. I don't know how to pronounce it, but hopefully it's spelled that right. Yeah, that's in the photo. I'll put it in the chat for anyone else who's curious. Um, also, because of California's relatively dry habitat, a lot of our plants tend to be drought tolerant. Even though they might not be happy out in the full sun, they tend to do pretty well with low water. So that makes it um, easier to take care of in this arid environment and uses less resources. And also they make really nice ornamentals. Usually when I think of an ornamental in a yard, I tend to think of like more exotic plants from like out of the country. They could be tropical plants or orchids and whatnot. But I was really um, pleased to learn that a lot of California native plants are very decorative actually. So the photos I have up there are penstemon, which is a deer tongue um, on the upper Oh, you see my nose? Perfect. On the upper left. We also have irises, which are really lovely. They come in different shades from like white to lavender to purples and blues. Um, I also saw some golden yellow ones at the garden the other day. So they're very lovely. And we also have some um, California native roses. So we have small little roses like you have in the photo at the bottom, but we also have a larger and more fragrant California rose that would look really lovely in your yard. Um, so yeah, now that I've gone over what native plants are and what California native plants are in all their glory, um, I wanted to share the, um, some struggles that they have. So that's what I have on this next slide. If I can advance to it, that would be nice. And if not, I'll figure something out. <laughs> no, I did. Perfect. <laughs> um, so I have some, I guess some threats to California native plants. There are quite a few threats mm -hmm. to native habitats overall. But I just wanted to mention a few that I'll be highlighting and focusing on throughout this presentation. So one of them is wildfire risk, like with climate change and all the other factors that go into it. Um, wildfire is responsible for destroying a lot of native um, habitats here in California. And another issue that will be like the main focus of my talk today is increasing urbanization. And um, a stat that I found out recently was how in the continental United States, so that does not include Hawaii or Alaska, so just in North America, United States alone, we have lost over 150 million acres of native habitat due to urbanization. And another striking um, a statistic is that over 40 million of those acres are just lawns. And um, <laughs> so that is, I'll be talking a little bit more about why that is an issue with native plants. Like, I'm not trying to hate on them, um, but I will, I will just want to bring to light the struggles of lawns and native habitats. <laughs> so, overall, the issues of urbanization and including lawns is that they don't support functioning ecosystems. When you think of a lawn, we don't really let it grow up that much so that it's adequate shelter for local creatures. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't also support pollinators. It doesn't help much with the native creatures in the area. Mm -hmm. And also with increasing urbanization, it causes high fragmentation of habitats. And that's something that I learned recently. Um, so I wanted to share with you all what fragmentation is. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> so fragmentation, like let's say, um, We'll have, I'm going to use an example. Have you all heard of P32, the cougar that lived mm -hmm. on Griffith Park? Yeah. Oh, so that is a great example for um, the results of high fragmentation. So P32 mm -hmm. lived up in Griffith Mountains area, which is where they had one intact native habitat. Um, but the thing with cougars and a lot of native creatures is that they need to migrate or disperse or, or overall have a large habitat to move around and find mates find food, find water, find shelter. Um, and the problem is with urbanization is that it divides their habitat. So, so P32 had his habitat up at Griffith Park area, and then there were houses in the middle, and there's highways in the middle, and then there was another intact habitat further down the valley. And what happened was, unfortunately, that P32 was trying to cross from the Griffith Park habitat to the lower valley one, and that's when he sadly passed away due to an accident on the highway. Mm. So that is one struggle of, of high fragmentation. So the, literally the habitats are fragmented mm -hmm. with urbanization cutting in the middle. And that impacts the native creatures, but it also impacts plants because plants need adequate space to survive and also spread their seed and all of that stuff to support these native creatures. So I want to um, bring that to light with you all, but I don't want you to fret because there, there is help. There's something we can do about this. 
Uh, so I have some responses listed here, and one of them that I'll be going over the most is growing native plants in your own yard. Um, and also besides that, if that is not as feasible, I also wanted to go over some climate conscious choices that we can all make together, and also how we can support conservation efforts, and that includes restoration efforts where organizations go out and restore habitats by growing native plants back in um, destroyed areas, and also the research that contributes to conservation efforts. Yeah, I'll be going over with that. Um, making sure there's no questions so far. Okay, seems like we're good. Perfect. So before I get into the whole growing native plants, I first wanted to go over the overall importance of native plants. So why protect them specifically? And I'll be going over those reasons I have listed on this slide. And one of them is to create a, bi they create a biodiverse habitat and they are naturally adapted to the environment. And also there are some ethics involved and they benefit us as humans. So I'd like to go over that with you all too. So the first point was biodiverse habitat. So with native plants, they can coexist with a lot of, they can coexist with each other and that prevents monocultures. And monoculture is basically when you only have one thing in your yard. And I just put the example of lawns because that's the first thing that came to mind and it's pretty common. So monoculture is just when you have one thing there and like that tends to be lawns. But when you have native plants, they can coexist really well with each other and that in itself increases diversity. And the, some of the ways they increase diversity is that they can vary in bloom time throughout the year. So they can support different pollinators. Um, yeah, and also they overall contribute to a healthy ecosystem in that they can provide more habitat to native insects and other animals, and they also provide food, and one of them being nectar with their different bloom times, and they can also provide food in the form of nuts, seeds, and fruit. So in all those ways, they can help our local animals that we have here. And another reason I wanted to point out, I'll, I'll talk about it more later in the PowerPoint, but it's also more suitable to sustain a healthy soil. So let's go over that. And but in the meantime, I also wanted to show you some cute photos. <laughs> so I have, so I just wanted to show some examples of how native plants support the native fauna that we have here in California. And um, on the left, I think, is of the American lady butterfly. That, and that one, that butterfly migrates to California. Mm. And so it's important to have native plants such as sage, where it likes to visit and refuel and all that. So um, sage is an important plant to support these butterflies. Um, we also have the California poppy, and that supports native bees. So we have a lot of native bees that are unfortunately in decline because of climate change and also with the honeybee, which is um, an invasive species, actually. So native plants actually can support these native bees more. Um, so I have those photos here. They also support larger creatures such as this hummingbird that is native to California and it is feeding um, on the nectar and this penstemon plant. So it's very popular because it gets tube shaped and just like the perfect size for the little beaks to go in. <laughs> um, and we also have our own little native um, bunnies, the desert cottontails. And they rely on shrubs such as the Ceanothus or the California lilac for shelter, and they also rely on it for food. They eat their home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't. <laughs> they can eat around their home. May I, may I ask uh, about the uh, penstemon? Does it come in orange? Um, yes, they come in a variety of colors. They come in reds, orange, whites. Because um, I have something that I bought at the Botanical Gardens years ago that gets very tall and has orange flowers that look a lot like that, and the hummingbirds love it, but I don't have never known the name. Oh, it might be a penstemon. Um, I do know they get pretty tall. I mean, I have not seen one taller than me. I'm five feet tall, but um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. <laughs> well, it comes up to the bottom of my window i get to sit by this window and watch the hummingbirds because the flower is right up above the bottom of the window so it's about five feet yeah okay thank you it's very thank likely you. it was yeah. well, sam has a oh sure go ahead sam um so there's tons of uh penstemons blooming now along the thompson creek trail um, especially on the the north side uh, of the the channel, um, 
and the city contractor who whacked down the weeds very gracefully oh. did not whack down the penstemons um, and the sunflowers. So if you want a chance to see these, now is the time along the Thompson Creek Trail. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Thank you, Sam. Mm -hmm. We're also very much in bloom at the California Botanic Garden, especially the purple and the white ones, and they're very pretty. Yeah, thank you guys for putting this out. It's really cool. Um, and also another one is that we have a native gray squirrel in California. And we do have those um, brown fox, fox squirrels that you see around, but those are unfortunately um, invasive. Mm -hmm. um, I did not know that either, but it's actually this California gray squirrel that I have up on the photo. Those are our squirrels, and um, they're near to this area, and they rely on our native oak trees. So it does perfect agrifolia, that is the coast live oak, and that oak tree is also very important to the indigenous group, the Tonga, that live in this area. And I mentioned earlier, I wanted to talk a little bit more about how native plants and native soil go together, so this is what this slide's about. And overall, the main story, the main goal is the, to show that how native plants create a more sustainable ecosystem with the relationship they have with the native soil. Mm -hmm. And in one of the ways is that because these plants are already adapted to the soil that they're growing in, they don't really need much input from you as the gardener. Like you don't really have to put in any extra nutrients or fertilizer. They are pretty much good to go with what they got in the native soil because mm -hmm. that's what they're used to. Um, and also with the benefit of roots of native uh, plants, because they're used to growing like all over like this terrain, like with the slopes and everything, um, the deep roots stabilize the soil and prevent erosion. So I might, you might see them a lot on slopes, especially on the highways. They're pretty good at keeping the slope from falling down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also with the deep rooted native plants, they break up heavy soil material, especially the clay further down. And they they improve the drainage of water, and they also um, make the nutrients in the soil more accessible to its neighboring plants. So it's really helpful of like getting the nutrients up and around instead of just trapped under the soil. And in general, um, native plants tend to restore nutrients back into the soil instead of just sucking them up. They tend to contribute to the overall ecosystem and make this very um, uh, sustainable system where they can both the soil and the plants can thrive together. Is this something that, um, like Caltrans and, and development or maintenance of, of or expansions of highways, that they're they take this into consideration on those slopes so. that they're planting these native plants to help prevent from them sliding down? Yeah, I, I think so. Actually, my professor did a workshop with Caltrans. He's a he's a botanist, of course. so he actually did a workshop with Caltrans this past week. So I'm sure they talked about um, that native plants and growing them along the transit routes. Stuart oh, Millick worked for Caltrans too. Yeah. Yeah. My sister worked for Santa Clara Water District, and her job was to make sure that uh, when the water areas were, you know, were filled, the gutters, whatever, were all filled with the creeks were filled with. Uh, with stuff and they needed to be cleaned out, she made sure that A, there were no hawk's nests in any tree that were going to be cut down, B, that they only got rid of non-natives, and C, that they replanted natives. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's see what else we got for you all. Oh, naturally that too. So this goes mm -hmm. along with my last point. Oh yes, I'll go over that photo very mm -hmm. shortly. <laughs> Um, so I want to go over how not only is it important to have native plants that are native to the state of California, if you live here, but it's also important to consider plants that are locally adapted to the environment that you are in. And the example I wanted to give was how we have different habitats. We have coast, we have salt marshes, we have desert and shrubs. Um, so if you have a more of a dry, more arid backyard, it probably would not work to put a salt marsh plant in your backyard. <laughs> so that's essentially what I'm trying to get at here. Like if you have a more arid environment in your backyard, um, it would be best to plant more of a plant that is suited for an arid environment. And the reason for that is that once you have that plant established, so maybe like the first couple months you have it planted in and everything, you'll have to baby it a little bit and make sure you water it. But once it's established, pretty much is really low maintenance. Like you barely have to water it or add anything to it because 
they adapt to the environment that you planted it in. Like they know how to take on the bugs that come at it. You don't really have to use as many herbicides or pesticides on it. Um, and you bear, yeah, and they wanted to mention how like if like you have less lawn, like you'll have less exhaust pollution from mowing the lawn. And um, as I said, like you'll have less chemical pollutants from adding fertilizers and using pesticides on them. And they require less watering. So the picture I wanted to show was of my friend, Rebecca. Um, she planted that sage about three years ago. Um, and she said like she had to baby it a little bit when she first planted it. But when she had it established, um, it started doing well just on its own. Like even if it got a little bit of aphids, it was not a problem. They got rid of it on its own. Mm -hmm. And she said that now, three years later, she has not watered it in over eight months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a picture of her just from, yeah, from this morning, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> So she sent that photo to say, look how big it is. Yeah. And she's like a little taller than me. Um, so yeah, that just goes to show that like if you have a native plant, it does just fine on its own. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really need your help that much. So it's pretty mm -hmm. low maintenance. And also like another plus, like on top of having low uh, less chemical pollutants and exhaust pollutants, um, they're very effective in storing greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide by mm -hmm. just having them around. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so now that I've gone over the logistics of native plants and why they are important to preserve and take care of with the environment, um, because I have the honor of speaking with you all, I wanted to share a bit of a Christian perspective of uh, native plants and habitats. So I first wanted to put on these Bible verses I thought were fitting to the talk. And the first one is from Genesis 1, 31, where it says that God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And in Isaiah 45, 18, for the Lord is God, and he created the heavens and earth and put everything in its place. He made the world to be lived in and not a place of empty chaos. And I also put the psalm of praise because I love praise psalms. Mm -hmm. uh, psalm 19, 1, the heavens proclaim the glory of God, the skies display his craftsmanship. So I wanted to talk about my interpretations of these verses in the next slide. Um, so what I got from that, and especially tying it back to native habitats, is that God created everything from the earth to the sky and everything that fills it. And he put everything in its place. He put all the native plants and all the native creatures in its place, and he called it good. And with that, my take was that God was the one who created these sustainable habitats with these intricate relationships between the birds and the insects and the plants. So he created all this very intertwined um, relationship. And so he created this balanced ecosystem. He also created living ecosystems that can that can thrive just by existing together. And we are a part of that ecosystem. So I wanted to bring that up too. In this next slide, when we talk a bit about stewardship. So stewardship, of course, we're familiar with Genesis 1:28, where God commanded Adam and Eve to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And I feel like plants go with that. I mean, they don't quite move the same way, but so I, I think God included plants in there. <laughs> and in Genesis 2.15, um, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So I thought that was very um, powerful to think about. And I also included the definition of stewardship which I learned um, means to use the gifts that God gave us with wisdom. And I would like to think also with good intention. And I also want to share my take from those verses, how God gave us humans the gift of being made in his image. And that is a wonderful thing and a blessing because God the creator made this beautiful earth with all these native habitats that like thrive like together and they coexist with one another in this beautiful way. And he created us in his image to take care for, take care of and maintain the earth that he lovingly created um, and to help sustain the native habitats that God designed with such intention and love. So I thought that was um, very important to me. And because God created these habitats with such love and care, um, so when we take care of this earth, it's not just to take care of God's creation, it also benefits us as humans, which I'm pretty sure God had in mind too. <laughs> So I wanted to share a little bit about how these native habitats and native plants could benefit us as humans. So I have here um, a bit of like a bunch of different reasons. And first I want to go over the word biophilium, which I learned of quite recently. I don't know if you guys know what this word means, but I just learned recently what it means and I fell in love with the word. So I had to share it with you all. 
And biophilia is the innate human instinct to connect with nature. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes, I know, I love it. Mm. And I thought that was really cool because one of my professors, I actually learned about this work from my undergrad professor, mm. who's also a plant person, so <laughs> go figure. Um, but like they have done studies where they compare people that have worked basically in offices that are that don't really have access to the outdoors or have any nature scenes compared to people that have like wind more windows or just more access to like nature around them. And essentially those who are exposed to more nature have better mental health mm-hmm. and better physical health. And I, I believe that is very much true. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> so mm-hmm. I'm glad to have windows and trees and plants mm-hmm. all around me. And so like on other notes, um, the native plants that we have here in California are just, they smell really nice. I like being around them because they smell just lovely. We have roses and other plants that smell really nice. And also they come in a lovely array of color. We have pinks and blues and reds and purples and oranges. Like just in Penstemons alone, we have so much different color. And I think that's amazing. And also another cool thing is how they have different bloom periods which is great for the pollinators as it supports them throughout the year, but also we get to enjoy these blooms all year long. So I see that as a win-win personally. <laughs> and also another um, benefit to us is if you have a fruit and vegetable garden, if you also incorporate some native plants, the native pollinators would visit the native plants you put, but they can also visit your native plant, your vegetable garden. So it also helps you get more fruits and veggies. Um, also many plants have of the, the native plants in California have great health benefits. Um, so I wanted to share that with you all. I'm doing another project where I'm trying to bring more awareness to the Tongva village, to the Tongva people that live in this area. And I got the honor to learn about um, the relationship with the plants that grow in this area. So I wanted to share some health benefits from these plants. So I have them on this slide. And for context, I'm very much a tea person. So these plants that I'm gonna talk about um, involve making tea, but you don't have to make tea if you don't want to. There's other ways you can use these plants. <laughs> um, the first one I wanted to bring up was the wild rose, which is Rosa californica. Mm-hmm. And the rose hips are very high in vitamin C. So they're very good for the, your immune system. And you could eat them raw if you want, or you can make them into a tea by boiling them in some water, then, um, what's it called, straining it. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so you can make a tea, and it's very good um, for your immune support. And also help with stomach aches. So if you have an upset stomach, some rose hip tea is very beneficial. Um, another plant that I have a photo of because I didn't know what this plant was until recently is the Wooly Blue Pearl. <laughs> it's such a cute plant. And also I think it looks more purple than blue, but that's another thing. I did not name this plant. But this plant, I just tried the tea from this plant a few weeks ago and it's very tasty. It has like this floral flavor and it's naturally sweetened. So like I didn't even need to add honey to it. It tastes mm. great just on its own. Hmm. It also has really good health benefits and that's anti-inflammatory. So um, they use the tea to help with cold, sore throats, and also headaches. Hmm. So that's really cool. And it tastes good, so another win-win. Is it the flower? Um well my how did you make the tea? Tea, my friend made it, she had a fruit dehydrator. Mm-hmm. And I think she had both the stem leaves, I think she had everything, the stem leaves and the flowers. Mm-hmm. So she just um, dried it in the fruit dehydrator, then she steeped it um, in water. Mm-hmm. So it's very good. And also the Matilla poppy, which is also the Friday poppy. I don't know if you guys have seen it before, but if not, I could, I'll look it up or have somebody look it up. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to have a picture. Sorry, well, we'll look it up later. We'll have the Q&A. Um, it is also known to have antimicrobial pop- properties, so the Tongva would use it as a skin wash, as mm-hmm. basically a disinfectant. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it also, um, the salve was used to, was helping with like with toothaches and also with minor abrasions or with cuts and burns. It also heals that. And I think also maybe you could make a tea out of it to help with stomach aches. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so yeah, those were, we talked about stewardship, we talked about the logistics and logical um, reasons for protecting native plants. So now I just wanted to go like the overall summary of this talk. They were very concerned with stomach problems. <laughs> <laughs> they were. I mean like, <laughs> I think it was just, they, it helped with multiple things and one of them was just stomach problems. <laughs> um, so overall talking about growing native plants. So the benefits of that is that this, Restoring um, yards to na- with native plants can reduce fragmentation that I mentioned earlier. 
by creating these patches of native habitat that the local uh, fauna, the animals can use to migrate with and also be supported and also the pollinators can be supported as they migrate long distances and that includes birds. Um, and also it can benefit us, us as humans as we get to enjoy the beauty of it and benefit from it with its different health benefits. And I want to go back to the other ways that we can help. So if growing native plants is not feasible for you right now, for whatever reason, that is all right. Um, the other ways that we can help is by making climate conscious choices. And one of them is by using public transportation when possible. I know that is difficult to do in a town that is, if it's not like as designed for public transportation or it's not as accessible, but when you can, then any little bit helps. And of course, there's conserving water, so not having it running when you don't need it, like when you're brushing your teeth, um, and also with reducing waste. So that includes using reusable products such as like water bottles or not using as many disposable things, and also making the most of things. I have that picture of a compost bin there to show one of the ways you can make the most of the food that we eat. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing that my friends do, I have not done this yet, but usually like, they'll have, they'll eat the vegetables and like, they have the scraps and they'll save some of the scraps so that includes like onion peels, garlic peels, and carrot tops and whatnot. They freeze those sort of vegetable scraps and then they would um, make a vegetable stock out of it. Hmm. And they say it was like a very tasty stock. And then after they're done with that, then they would put the scraps in the compost bin. So they really made the mm -hmm. most out of the vegetables. Mm -hmm. And also I want to bring up supporting conservation efforts as another way that we could help with these native habitats. And one of them was um, the California Botanic Garden where I attend and go to school and do research. And at the garden, um, we have um, staff that do restoration projects. As I mentioned before, they go out to the destroyed habitats and they put native plants back in the area to bring it back to life. We also have a grow native nursery. So if you would like to purchase any native plants for your garden, we have native plants there that are in season. So when you buy them, they're they're like that is the time for you to plant it. So oh, yeah. yeah. So we only sell plants that are like in season to be planted at the at the time um, of year that you buy them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also we have a graduate program there that I am a part of, and we do research to aid in conservation. We have students um, that go out and have like these study areas where they do inventory of what plants are there and also note of any plants of conservation concern or rare plants. And they give this information to the local counties um, who use this information to help with conservation efforts. And also we have the California Native Plant Society. So that's on like a larger scale. They do statewide legislation. They do like the 30 by 30 sort of campaigns. Um, and they also do land conservation campaigns, and they also um, have opportunities for education, as well as the California Botanic Garden. We both have opportunities if you'd like to learn more about California plants, whether it be for gardening or for just learning how to help. Um, we both have opportunities for learning more about um, this sort of topic. And I also have some more resources here on this slide. Um, and I think Brad had mentioned to me how some of you may want some gardening tips about what plants to plant when and all that. That is not necessarily my area of expertise, but I did talk to one of the horticulturists at the garden. Her name is Laura Christanson, and she um, was happy to give me her email and her Instagram if you guys would like to reach out to her. She has a lot of knowledge about um, like when to grow things and how to get things to germinate. She is, like She's really knowledgeable about that sort of stuff. So I'll leave that email with, with you all. And if you want a copy of this slide, I can also send that to you. And organizations that can also help that information include the Theodore Payne Foundation. I think it's in Tahanga, I'm not 100% sure, but they also have a garden and native plant nursery. And then same, as I mentioned the last slide, you have the California Native Plant Society, as well as the California Plant Garden. We both, um, we all have a lot of resources to help with education purposes, or just if you're learning, how to plant um, a native garden, we can help you with that as well. Um, so, and I also have these pamphlets here in person. So if you wanted these pamphlets, I could pass them around to you. And they have a list of different resources from where to get native plants, how to get started, mm -hmm. um, education mm -hmm. classes. Maybe mm -hmm. in the library and shop. Oh yeah, you can use but, them too. Um, what I might do is because most, most folks 
the next place that they'll visit a church is a sanctuary. Yeah. So maybe we can put them on the little table Good in the narthex. Good idea. Sure. And then I also have, I don't know if you all can see this, but I also have this um, little card. So buy one, get one free admission at the California Botanic Garden that is um, valid for like the next year. So until next June. So yeah, Cassie's already can keep them here at the church too. So if anyone wants to come by and grab some more. This, this is a one-time admission? Um, yes. Yeah. We is. can put these out there too. Yeah. That'd be good to promote with folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are the resources. And then after this, I just have my references and my thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was so pleased that the at the Botanic Garden, the native plant nursery, uh -huh. that if you're a member of the gardens, you get 10% discount. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. And I think membership is, I can't remember if it's $30 or $50, one of the two, but it's for the year. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's definitely worth it. Oh, yeah. For the resources and for... Oh, absolutely. And just being able to walk in the garden, you know? Mm -hmm. My 12-year-old just did a... At Mountain View, he did... What is it called? The LEAP program, which is a leadership thing. Mm -hmm. But they got to go every week for, I think, seven weeks over to the field station. Okay. And got to learn from some of the experts around there about cool. the land and the plants and this and that. And Hmm. Yeah, there's so many great things and benefits of having the garden here in, in that area. Yeah. yeah, thank you all for listening. It was a pleasure to have you all here, and I appreciate all your questions so far, and I appreciate your attention and for letting me come talk to you about native plants. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, of course. There are any questions? I hope you should learn something. Yeah. Oh, I have a question. Not, not. Uh, uh, for you, but Tina, what was the book you were telling us about? I, I put it in the chat, Elaine. It's oh, um, oh, oh, oh. Sacred I, I Earth, Sacred it. Soul. Hmm? Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul. Thank you. By John, By John Philip Newell. Newell. It's more just a, a going through Christian history to some extent and where we went wrong at times <laughs> and who went right. <laughs> I use it's a lot of his prayers for my evening prayer. I use a lot of John Philip mm -hmm. Newell. Mm -hmm. One thing that um, I've been learning in regards to planting with natives is, and I noticed you mentioned it, um, if a plant is more sun tolerant, some of the clues are that the leaves are smaller. So I have a rosemary bush, which of course they're like needles. Their leaves are almost mm -hmm. like needle size. And it is wonderful in the sun. And um, then if you have something with um, a larger leaf, of course, then it ends up burning in our 90 degree summers, mm -hmm. even though it's California native and drought tolerant. Uh, but the rosemary, because it's so small and it's not dark green, mm -hmm. it's kind of a lighter green. Yeah. And I mean, it's just a, these little microclimates, I guess you call it. You know, it's like, is it, un, is it, the other problem I've had, I had a problem with is you had a picture of a uh, California mountain lilac, uh, mm -hmm. but it's called Ceanothus. Ceanothus. Mm -hmm. And I tried to grow one under, in the shade of my oak tree, mm -hmm. and it just sits there year after year. It doesn't die. But it doesn't grow. <laughs> and then I planted one out in a sunny area. And that thing is now like that picture. You took. It's taller than me. Whoa. And it's because it, it didn't want the oak tree shade. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And it, it just, you know, kind of amazes me how it's like real. They are really kind of finicky about Sun or no sun? Yes. <laughs> I did I did put it in my slide, but I'm sorry if I didn't say it out loud, but I think you might have read it. Like the way that you can tell whether it's a sun plant versus a shade plant is usually by looking at its leaves. Yeah. So the sun plants tend to be lighter in color because like the greenness in plants is from the chlorophyll, which does the photosynthesis. So if it's in the sun, because it's getting so much intense light at it, it doesn't need that much chlorophyll up at the surface. So it tends to be lighter in color, so less green. Um, and they also tend to be smaller leaves, like just like you mentioned with mm -hmm. your rosemary. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, plants that are out in the sun, they also tend to be protected by extra things, such as um, hair or little furs mm -hmm. on them. 
So a lot of sun plants are also furry mm. to kind of protect them. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then the shade plants are like the opposite, like you mentioned, with your, with your broad leaves. So mm -hmm. shade plants, because they are suited for less sun, they tend to be wider and more broad, and they tend to be darker with more chloroplast at the surface. Mm -hmm. So they are more adapted to being mm -hmm. in the shade. And there's like this whole thing with like surface area to volume ratio that we learned in science oh. class, but we won't go over that. <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole science what, to it. What about the pH of the um, soil? Are we, um, is our soil more alkaline here? And, and how does that make a difference? That's a good question. I don't know the pH of our soil here, but I think that's definitely a question that our horticulturists can answer for you. I'm sorry, I don't know at the top of my head. That's okay. Thank Just you. Mm -hmm. The toyon we have a lot also intermixed with the oak tree. Um, and during a certain time of year, the red berries, uh, we had hordes of robins descend on those red berries mm -hmm. that Cohen, and the Toyon bush was having. It was amazing. I have a little fun story about that. The Toyon berries get birds a little intoxicated. Yeah. So they come in like a little tipsy <laughs> <laughs> on Toyon berries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, would that be the same for us as well? Oh, I don't know. We have a lot of berries. Oh, I don't know. And like, again, like things that birds eat are not always edible to us humans. So yeah, um, I thought I read that humans shouldn't eat. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, and Scott Randall's told that because I had asked him about the the toyon tree when it gets more mature and it starts producing those berries. Is it dangerous for the children? Mm -hmm. Because that came up with one of the other small shrubs. Mm -hmm. You know, they grow big and they have the bright red berries. But he said that in his understanding, they they're not necessarily poisonous. But they're bitter, oh. so that people yeah. don't tend to eat them. Mm -hmm. um, but the birds love them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're definitely um, very bitter for the birds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice I, for the birds. <laughs> yeah, I tend, yeah. I go, I do a little mini foraging when I'm out walking in the gardens because we have like that native strawberry plant I told you, and you also have the native gooseberries. So I tend to go on a little foraging trip when I'm on my walk, and I like taste the different strawberry plants to see which one tastes good. And then some of them, I'll be like, oh, no, it's not really my thing. I think I'll leave this for the birds. Other ones are like, oh, no, this one I like. <laughs> yeah. Mahima, I, I have a question. Uh, when I hear the term native plants, I just think that's a California thing. Are, as I'm wondering, as you're talking, are other areas or regions of the country or states that, that you know of do they do their own native thing, like like encouraging uh, turf removal and planting the natives for that area, or are we very unique in that here? Hmm, that is a good question. Our native plants. Okay. Of course, we like to talk it up here because we're actually in California. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if you met, remember I mentioned the California Native Plant Society earlier on. Um, but other states have their own native plant societies. So mm -hmm. the Nevada state has a Nevada native plant society, and the Idaho has an Idaho native plant society. I so know. they do. I actually got a grant from them recently. So a lot I think of Texas people. does too. Okay, cool. Yeah, I haven't looked into all this, but I know um, because my research involves um, my research kind of goes a little out of state to the other Western United States. Um, I had to contact uh, like from Utah to Idaho to Arizona, New Mexico, and so far all of them have a native plant society of their own and do their own mm -hmm. conservation efforts. Okay, that's good. I don't, no, I don't know if you've ever been to what is it, Louisiana area? They are overrun with a vine that mm -hmm. it, pardon, cuts through, cuts through. Mm -hmm. it's killing, it's not native and it grows over all the plants and it's just killing yeah, everything. Mm -hmm. So those are another struggle of invasive oh. plants. Terrible. They don't leave room because the issue with invasive plants is that because they are not from the area, they don't have their natural predator or herbivore mm -hmm. to keep the kind of control over them. So that makes it a struggle. And then the native animals are like, I don't know what to do with this thing. Yeah. So. yeah and the mustard seems to be the most prolific. Yeah. I haven't seen any, a gray squirrel. I don't think I've ever seen a California gray mm -hmm. squirrel. They're all the red. Mm -hmm. Oh, the I, red I think we everywhere. have a muffin. At Live Oak, 
Yeah, I think yeah. we have the garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some more. They're all over the place in where you are, but they're red. Yeah, they're so not red. Yeah, one of the things that I picked up on is biophilia. We're talking about the squirrels. Red, red squirrels <laughs> gnawing on our uh, on our houses. And, oh, and, and, and with me, they like to dig up my, uh, I, have, yeah. I have a lot of container gardening, and they yeah. like to dig it up. You know, you, I'll go out one day and a plant the roots will be up in the air, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, so let's, sport, let's get the gray ones back. <laughs> <laughs> but the biophilia term, that kind of emotional connection to the plants and the, and nature, I I tell people because they always people always kind of like why would you go out to the desert? Why would you? What beauty would you see? And you know it's amazing like the Mojave the colors of flowers and plants that will bloom and it is for a very short time but i mean from cactus to the mesquite tree mm -hmm. to um just so many the ocotillo is really cool when yeah. it blooms because it looks like i call it the pentecost plant because <laughs> it looks like the pentecost flames on the top but it is it's one connection thing I have when I drive out there at certain times of the year. And have you smelled the creosote bush when you're out in the Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, the yeah. lovely desert rain smell. Yeah, don't don't tell the rangers that I sometimes will pick off a spray of it and I'll put it in the car <laughs> because the sun will make the fragrance permeate through the car, yeah, and I love that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You mentioned also in the bite what is called again biophilia. Mm -hmm. uh, the part of that I read an article about um, the the wonder of nature, it, and you mentioned it briefly, uh, is a very good mental health um, mm -hmm. factor. And uh, the people should always be um, trying to say, "Have I found something that creates one wonder for me?" Not W A N, but W O N. Wonder. Wonder. Yeah. yeah. The sense of awe that uh, a garden, you know, you can go out in your garden and you can, like, my mom had like 12 monarch caterpillars on her uh, milkweed. Mm. And so, like, we had this excitement for a week or two weeks while we watched them get bigger and then they crawled off. To, you know, just the whole excitement of little things like that that can bring wonder and joy and good mental health. <laughs> And actually, I took a, a plant biology class in my undergrad, and one of the assignments was um, was like learning about like how gardens in different areas could like help improve things. Like, so one of the things that we learned about was gardens in places like hospitals, mm. um, or like at mental health institutions, so just to help um, engage and like just benefit overall the patients mm -hmm. and and people there. Mm -hmm. yeah. For my for my birthday, when I came home on Saturday, uh, there was a big word. You had heard some of it earlier between Brad and me. But I came home on Saturday, and my 18-year-old had heard, had bought me two bouquets of flowers. <laughs> and so I came into the house, and there were these beautiful displays of flowers. And it's just, it may, it just brightens things up mm -hmm. in, in yeah. the house, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ooh, there's this book. I don't know if they're still selling it at the garden. I gave you bought a big bouquet. Um, there's this book called um, California like Innovates or something like that. And it's basically this book about different floral arrangements of California native oh. plants throughout the year. Oh. It's mm. so cool. That'd be interesting yes. for our our uh, church sanctuary flower ideas um, mm -hmm. and the under the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I looked through the book um, and I bought it for my professor because he's kind of the plant person. But yeah, it's really pretty. Like what. Like even in like the winter, like when you don't really feel this much there, like they incorporated some beautiful um winter plants to make um really nice arrangements. A couple of, few years ago when my daughter was getting married, I was impressed with she didn't choose this, but um the wedding florist that she looked at often incorporated manzanita. Ooh, cool. Just the beautiful colors mm -hmm. and shapes of the manzanita mm -hmm. branches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, very much incorporating native California into the floor. Any other questions, comments?
Anyone online? <laughs> well, great. Well, Mahima, thank you for presenting to us and sharing this information. I, I think that it, um, for several of us, there were different pieces that were like, wow, I didn't know that. And, oh. and, and what the connection made. And uh, as one of the pastors here at the church, hearing you kind of share your interpretations of some of the scripture passages was really um, pleasant also. Um, that's something that we're focusing on also is not just to learn. It's great to learn about native plants and it's great to learn about what they do for the land and for the ecosystems. But, you know, learning who we're called to be as good stewards of that. And, mm -hmm. um, so being part of keeping and sustaining that ecosystem as God and as God planned. So yes. I think that's great. Thank you. Of course. Thank you all for being here. It was a pleasure to speak to you all. Mm -hmm. um, June 26th, I believe that's a Monday, uh, mm -hmm. is the next time that we, is part two of this series. Uh, and um, we're going to be inviting uh, Uncommon Good as well as a few of our church members to talk about uh, growing produce in, on our property. So mm -hmm. either the church or the uncommon good or mm -hmm. at your home and what that does for you, why you feel called to do that, what you do with the produce after you mm -hmm. grow it, what you can do with it, other options. And so um, you'll want to come to that. It, we're, we're working it out with uncommon good that we should be having a light meal uh, made with some of the um, the produce uh, that's grown around town. So we hope that you can make it for that. It will only be in person. So we hope that you will make that a, a priority on your calendar to come out for that. You are so welcome yeah. to join us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might be doing research that day. Like, maybe out in New Mexico. Who knows? <laughs> but thank you. Oh, I also wanted to thank um, Dave and Elise there from my church, though. Thank you for attending, guys. <laughs> okay. We're happy to have you. Yeah. All right. Bye, Sam. Everybody. Have Bye, a good Sam. night, everybody. Bye, Kat. Bye. <laughs>